Let's bomb Russia! Meow! I'm Hoople's Cat. Hope you're all doing great. Welcome to uh, the second video on a lecture that the CDC published in 2018 with a case study based upon a 10 kiloton ground-based nuclear explosion right in the middle of Washington DC. In this video we now turn our attention to Fallout. And I promise you that you will learn stuff that I sincerely hope you never have occasion to use. Now fallout is formed when the fireball from the explosion which is so hot, it actually shoots up at over 100 miles per hour. That fireball sucks up dirt and debris with it, thousands of tons of dirt and debris. And it mixes with all the radioactive material that was generated during the nuclear explosion to create fallout. This fallout cloud will rise over the first few minutes after the event, stabilize maybe at five miles into the atmosphere. This case study is from a 10 kiloton ground burst weapon. An 800 kiloton Russian ICBM that is an airburst weapon will be somewhat different, but the survival rules will be basically the same for both. For this scenario, he also is going to use actual real world weather data. So you can see those sort of purple ping pong balls, those represent what the cloud is doing. The color changes on the ground represents what happened after those fallout particles get back to the ground and the radiation levels that they give off. So I'm going to show you what's happening over the first few hours of this event. You can see the clock in the upper right hand corner. Two hours, uh, the bottom part of the cloud is swept over BWI. You notice it only took an hour for the top part of the cloud to get out over the Atlantic? That's because at five miles, the winds are going a lot faster than on the ground, and often in a different direction. This is a really, really critical point. It's okay knowing where the prevailing winds are at ground level, but you really need to know ground level and also prevailing winds up at altitude, miles up in the atmosphere. So as soon as it's safe after the flash and the blast, look up. Try to see where the clouds are starting to form from the mushroom cloud. You will see the mushroom cloud go up. It's perfectly reasonable at that point to start moving away from it as fast as you can. But make sure you keep an eye on it. If that wind starts to head towards you, you want to alter your direction 90 degrees either side, whichever side is the easiest to access to get away from the cone and also the easiest to access in terms of escape. So if you go like this and, okay, which way is the cloud going to go? you probably are going to guess wrong. And your chances at running that cloud aren't that great to begin with. Survival shows in Hollywood films show running away using cars, using motorbikes, using hot wiring cars to escape from an atomic explosion and successfully getting away from it. If you're that time pressure to get away from the radiation, it probably means that the roads you're trying to drive along are covered in burning buildings, burning trees, burning people, burning cars, and are blocked. So think about that type of scenario. How are you actually going to get away? If the roads are open and clear and you're able to get a car and drive away, I'd drive away. Who wouldn't? But I wouldn't drive away like a crazy person and have a car accident. Now I'm going to keep the clock going forward three hours, four hours. You can see there was actually a wind shift in the afternoon, and some of that material started coming back down. Six hours in, you can see the expanse of the contaminated area. 12 hours now, you're going to see something strange happen. It's actually shrinking. And the reasons it's shrinking is we define these zones by the radiation levels. And that's the silver lining of our fallout cloud. Radiation decays. Radiation from the fallout gives off half of its energy in the first hour. Shelter is almost always going to be your priority in the first 12 to 24 hours after an atomic blast rather than fleeing. Almost always, there are exceptions to that. 80% in the first day. So that's great news, it's going to be 80% less lethal 24 hours after the bomb hits. But if you're that close to the bomb or if you're in an area where the fallout has really dropped heavily, that 20% can still kill you. So the 12 to 24 hours is a minimum amount of time that you would stay sheltered. And you'd only move after that period of time if you had no realistic choice but to move. What you're concerned about is not breathing fallout, it's these salt and sand-sized particles that come down to the ground, land, and give off this penetrating gamma radiation. Avoiding that gamma radiation is what you're trying to do when you protect yourself from fallout, which is why where you go after an event like this is really important. I agree with this, but I always carry in 95s anyway for smoke and dust inhalation from falling buildings and fires. It's not a bad idea to carry some. If you don't want to carry N95s, carry a couple of bandanas. As war became more likely, and it's becoming more likely, I would start to carry goggles. The direct confrontation between NATO and Russia is World War III. With the events that are going on around our world and the very real threat that we might face world war, or even worse, 
nuclear war in the next couple of months. That I've signed legislation that will outlaw Russia forever. We begin <laughs> bombing in five minutes. However, all of this misses the point. In high gamma radiation areas, your priority is to get away from the gamma radiation as fast as possible, either by going deep underground or inside a building, or by physically moving away from the source of it if it's above ground. If you have access to a full NBC suit, a noddy suit as the British call them, you absolutely cannot just chillax out there in the radiation zone, in, certainly not in the first 24 hours of a nuclear strike. Hi folks, the aim of this video is to show you how to wear a Mark IV British NBC suit, or CBRN suit. Lastly, the respirator itself, ensuring that the edge of the hood is not obscuring your eyes. It should be as so. The gamma radiation will still get through NBC suits, will still get through respirator masks and will kill you. You want to go to a spot that gets you as far away from the fallout that's on the roof or on the ground and has as much mass between you and the fallout as possible. Now you can think of the numbers on the screen like SPF of sunscreen. The bigger the number, the better the protection. Getting into, if you, have a, if you happen to be in a suburban neighborhood, getting to the middle of your house would be great. If you got a basement, even better. Even a half basement's fine. Getting into a basement can give you adequate protection. This is true if the building's not on fire and intact, otherwise you're probably gonna die anyway. And if you're in an urban area like this where most brick buildings, cement buildings, three or four story buildings, you've got great protection off it. I'll also say that this building, I encourage you when you walk out to look up at it, this is a big brick building, there's a cement, there's a stairway going downstairs so we know there's a basement. You could easily get protection factors of 100 or more in the core, in the middle of this building, or in the basement. I agree with him here. I do think whenever I go into a building or I go into anywhere new, I have a good look around on arrival and I poke around on the way to the washrooms, which I go do sooner rather than later. I have a good look, I have a good think. How do I get out of here if there's a shooter? How do I get out of here if there's a sudden fire? Is it possible to get into the basement? Is it possible to get deeper into the building if there's a radiation event? Where the water, where the food stores? Think about things like that when you go into buildings. Be more creative about what's around you rather than just focused on what you're there for. In his scenario, if you were in Annapolis, you would have probably seen the flash and you probably would have heard the explosion. Maybe not, depends, but you may have. Within 60 minutes of this event, gamma radiation is dropping all over Annapolis. During those 60 minutes, you should have either fled in an opposite direction from the prevailing wind if you can see the cloud coming towards you, or you should have gone deep into a building, into a basement, with food and water for three to four days, preferably longer if you can grab it. Remember, you don't have to eat a lot, but you're definitely going to need to drink a lot, and you need to drink water from a bottle. I can guarantee in the horrible event of this scenario of occurring, the government's not going to issue shelter-in-place, deep-in-place orders for the people of Annapolis within 60 minutes of a sudden unexpected nuclear explosion over in Washington, D.C. You need to be looking at this stuff and dealing with it yourself. Relying on radio, relying on telephone, relying on other people, not the greatest idea. Now, a huge number of areas around Washington, D.C. were totally unaffected by the radiation. What I'm saying is, I don't care. Shelter in place within 30 minutes, a maximum of 60 minutes from when you see a flash and hear an explosion that's atomic in nature. Get underground get safe, have supplies, stay there until somebody tells you it's safe to come out, preferably by using a Geiger camera. Now it should be obvious to you by now you need to have a decent sized backpack with a fair amount of water in it and quite a few survival supplies in. Basically a soup to get home back. So you can stay away from home for seven days, maybe even 14 days. But have a good think about what you can put in that bag, considering that it might get cold, it might be uncomfortable, but that doesn't matter. This is about not being outside getting gamma radiation falling on you directly. That's what this is about. However awful, however uncomfortable it is, do not permit gamma radiation to come in contact with you. Given the availability of sheltering, we asked the question, how many lives can be saved through shelter? Well, in order to answer that question, I sort of need a control group. So if everybody in the scenario I just talked about for a Washington DC explosion, if everybody stood outside for the first 24 hours, not the recommended strategy, but if everybody stood outside for the first 24 hours, we would have about 280,000 people that would get enough radiation exposure to make them sick or potentially kill them. Have a very intense look at this slide and remember it. Look how the gamma radiation risk drops. The less gamma radiation risk, the less chance of you dying of cancer. 
It's possible, even in nuclear war, to survive the initial event if you act fast, if you act really quickly to get decent shelter, whatever that constructs around you, within 30 minutes, preferably within 15 minutes, but it could be up to 60 minutes. Get underground, have water, have a little bit of food, have a radio, have some supplies. Those same people, all of the people in DC, just ran into a poor shelter. Not that you can find a lot of poor shelters in DC. It takes a while to find a one or two story wood frame house. But if everybody ran into one of those, we would still save 150,000 people from significant exposure. If everybody just went into a poor shelter. And if you went into what we consider an adequate shelter, which is say a half basement of a, of a wood frame house or the worst shelter location in this building, if you went to the top floor next to the roof or on the periphery of the building, you'd still have a protection factor of 10. We would save 245,000 people from significant exposure. Having an awesome, incredible bug out vehicle and driving it away from the scene of a nuclear explosion might seem like a good thing to do. But I would point out to you, except for very specifically types of army vehicle that are designed for it, most cars and trucks actually provide very, very little gamma radiation protection and it's going to be dropping all over you. So your bug out vehicle full up to the brim with gear and you drive out in might kill you. You might be better waiting with it in the garage for a little while before you left. And the people that did get some kind of exposure tend to be in the sick but not dead category. Now, I'll say in DC, it's not hard to find protection factor 50 or more. If everybody in DC were to able to get in that protection factor 50, there's a basement in this building, the core of this building, or more, we'd have no fallout casualties, no fallout significant exposures. Fallout is a preventable casualty. Maybe, but education is going to be required for everybody. And in a nuclear war, you're going to get irradiated. It's, it's just not possible not to increase your percentage chance of getting cancer and dying. Reducing the impact of that cancer risk is what this is all about. And how you do that is simple. Increase the time you spend as far away from sources of gamma radiation as possible. Increase the amount of time you spend deep underground or with thick walls around you to the maximum amount you can do. You could stay underground in a sealed area for three months. Your chances of getting cancer when you re-emerge are actually very, very much reduced. But that's not really possible for most people, is it? And when you do emerge from wherever your shelter is, you've got to have food and water and security and community. Without those things, you're not going to be safe. And without those things, you're not going to be able to survive. The idea of the lone wolf going through the irradiated city, finding tins of baked beans, is absolutely farcical. You will die in that situation, especially if you try and use an Israeli gas mask. And it takes time for the fallout to get to us. Remember that cloud? It's got to get up, cool, all those particles come back down. You, even if you're close to the event, you've got at least 15 minutes before the, that material starts accumulating. So you set your timer straight away. Remembering conditions of stress and shock, time alters and you need to actually have decent time. Set the clock for 15 minutes, get shelter within 15 minutes. You want really decent shelter, so it's worth spending an extra 15 minutes if you have to, and it's obviously not radiations coming down on you. You might want to look for an extra 15 minutes. But really, by 30 minutes, you want to be buried into something as deep as possible. Having got into there, food and water and heat and clothing, anything you can get that you might be able to use over the next week to two weeks, gather as quickly as you can from that building. Remember, you can go to the outside of the building and grab the stuff very early on. Later on, it's not so much. Remember, in flat single-story buildings, the ceiling is a really issue problem for you. If it's intact, that's great, but you don't really want that radiation there. So you, what you want to do in that case is actually have a barrier above you between you and the ceiling. And remember, time expands and contracts based upon stress and fear and is actually a subjective phenomenon. Set your watch, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, make sure you know what you're doing. Remember, you're not Batman. Timing this so you find shelter at exactly 60 minutes is not the point. Finding shelter in the first 15 minutes that's decent is the point. If you can't find decent shelter in the first 15 minutes, find it within 30 minutes. Really, find it. So how long? That's the next question I get. All right, you sold me, we're gonna shelter. You really wanna stay sheltered in place wherever it's safe to be so for as long as you can. Now you also hopefully have a pre-supply place to go to. So after seven days or 14 days or 21 days or 28 days, you would then be able to leave and quickly as possible go to your bug out place or your home or your cottage or RV vehicle or a friend's and have clean water and clean food and supplies. How long do we have to hang out together because that candy machine ain't going to supply us for long? Well, remember that decay rate I talked about? 
I've sort of circled in that uh, yellow dashed line the dangerous fallout zone from this event. At one hour, it's about that size. The dangerous fallout zone is an area where you can actually get enough exposure to make you sick or potentially kill you. Now as I move the clock forward, two hours, three hours, notice how quickly that's shrinking back. So you really just want to avoid being outside in the first few hours of this event. After a couple days, that dangerous fallout zone actually disappears. Now, there's still contamination. Don't get me wrong. Your meters be clicking like crazy. But the, the radiation levels that cause that acute injury really decay away in the first few hours and days of the event. If you have nothing in that shelter, and the shelter is not compromised to the point of really being dangerous by fire or by crazy people, you absolutely stay in that shelter for 24 hours without moving. Even if you have no water and it's freezing cold, do not move for at least 24 hours. Obviously, if you're 150, 200 miles away, you probably not, aren't going to shelter in place in the nearest available place, so you're gonna go home. Again, use common sense. So out of all of this work and the science, a bunch of great guidance was developed. Planning guides for response to nuclear detonation and communication guides and health and safety guides have all been developed to help emergency managers understand and prepare for an event like this, and hopefully, we may never have to, but if you need to, help you respond. I'll simplify it though. Comes down to really a couple simple things. I'm gonna keep saying this, shelter for as long as you can and for as deep as you can. Get inside. Get inside the basement or the middle of the building, same place you would go for a hurricane or a tornado. Plan to stay there 12 to 24 hours. And stay tuned. AM FM radio works best because outside of the area of, of impact, Radio towers will still be working, and those messages and that transmission can get into the places that have been impacted. Radio, USB card, also has batteries, also has solar panel, and it has a crank, and now these cranks break very easily, so I don't recommend using the crank unless you have no other choice. But one of these is a good idea. Counsel a younger person in the family in ways that are really profound. So, then so I have shortwave on this, as well as AM, as well as FM. But in a nuclear war, there's probably not going to be anybody transmitting on a commercial or even a government channel for quite some time. So you might want to consider a ham radio, which are illegal unless you have a license, like a Baofang. I have a few of them. I'm not currently carrying them. I'm not currently carrying the radio because I'm not actually moving very far from home, which is my bug out location. But if I was traveling 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers, 80 miles, I would take this with me. Because who knows? Going back here, would be my preferred thing to do. If I'm that close to a nuclear explosion, I need a shelter for at least 24 hours wherever I am, as safely as I can. For all purpose, talk about ham radios and CB radios and everything else, and they all have a place. In a full-on nuclear war, you're gonna get information by walking around, bumping into other people who are walking around, or possibly on a bicycle or a horse, and that's your information route. Our whole world will contract to about five miles to 10 miles from where you actually are at the time of the bomb going off. There's numerous prepper fiction about people traveling the length and breadth of the United States to get home, to reunite with their family, to save their wife, to save, to reunite with a girlfriend, whatever it is, hero stories. The reality of it is to actually move on foot post a full on nuclear strike is gonna be extremely dangerous, both in terms of radiation and security and it may well not be feasible. It's not something you should willingly do. Now, obviously, if you have a job and you're a truck driver and you have to keep working, you have to keep working. But things are getting really tightly serious and people are starting to shoot each other in Europe or wherever, consider calling sick. It might be worthwhile to lose a bit of pay. So in the next video or two, what we're gonna cover is the following topics. What if the bomb shield was higher than 10 kilotons? Is an 800 kiloton Russian ICBM 80 times worse than a 10 kiloton terrorist bomb? What about air bursts? Does that make too much of a difference? They're gonna use Nagasaki and Hiroshima as a case study for that one. Not in detail, but just to talk about the type of mushroom cloud formation, what it meant for air bursts compared to ground bursts in terms of fallout risk. He's then gonna show Duck and Cover 2.0. Now, it obviously didn't take off because it's 2022 and I haven't heard of Duck and Cover 2.0 and this was 2018. But honestly, it's really well worth looking at and we're gonna spend some time looking at that because it will increase your survival rate if you follow it. He also talks about what actions you need to take if there's a warning that an imminent nuclear strike is gonna happen, as opposed to there is no warning. And this stuff is really key, and this stuff is stuff you really wanna teach everybody you love and like.
and hope they never use it. Spend some time showing some online tools. I'll verify they're still open. Those links are open and there's some slides as well that he did. So all of this stuff's information and it's pretty good information and I'm absolutely happy that I stumbled on this. The guy is a theoretical physicist. Physicists tend to know their stuff. So the next video is going to be action packs, which you might have said it might be two videos. He's actually going to talk about why terrorists would use a 10 kiloton bomb. What are the principles for Joe Average for decontamination? And also, and this is the interesting one, what do you do if the attack is truly catastrophic? Well, I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you absolutely use this for entertainment purposes only and you never have to use it in real life situations. I will say that I might be personally liable for you if you use any of this information in a full on nuclear war and get damaged by it, but you'll have to find me to sue me. Toodles. This has been an Attack Warning Red Wolfie Terrier production 2022. Wolfie's waiting for his mummy to come back from a bath. <laughs>